What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Today's episode, which I don't normally put out on Friday, was just a little podcast appearance I did on the homie Najee Adams' Run It Up podcast. It was actually someone that applied for the BDG internship like two years ago. And apparently this was my response. I don't think that's how I reacted, but I don't put it above or below me. Anyways, he asked me to come onto the podcast. So for the first 20 or 30 minutes of this video, uh, he's asking me questions just about my personal life, BDGE brand, uh, creating content on YouTube or whatever. And then the last half of the video is us going uh, through some must draft players, some, some fades for this year. He goes round one through 10 and he gives me a couple names and we do a draft or pass uh, segment. Actually, we call it Tuck or Untuck, which I kind of love and might steal from him. And that's really the episode. So I want to break it down. If you're not interested in the BDGE shit, then get the fuck out of here. Now, if you're not interested in it, then obviously skip to, I don't know, whatever part of the video it is, maybe 30 minutes in or some shit. Uh, otherwise, go subscribe to the Run It Up podcast. Make sure you go follow Najee. I will put his Twitter link in the bio. I'm someone who believes that if you're making content, you want it to be seen by as many people. So anytime I get on a guest pod or a guest YouTube channel or whatever, I will probably upload it to my channel as well to hopefully give you all as much value as humanely as alienly possible throughout this summer again enjoy the pod go follow naji shit and uh if anyone's got an internship available for him give it to the man what is up everybody and welcome back to another episode of the run it up podcast here on the blue wire podcast network and blue wire hustle i am your host naji adams and today we have a very very special episode with a very very special guest uh let me just go ahead and introduce him Nicholas Ercolano, Nick Ercolano, Nick BDGE, a man of many names, you feel <laughs> me? How are you doing today, bro? I'm good, man. I always uh I always wonder how I'm going to be introduced cuz most people <laughs> most people fuck my last name up, so they just end up going with Nick BDGE and then I'm like, "Wait, do you even know what my name is?" you know? So I appreciate you throwing out like the seven different variations. Let me know. <laughs> let me know that you're a real one. Did I get it right or did I Yeah, mention? yeah, you did. It was spot on. It was beautiful. Boom. There we go. See, I was practicing, bro. I was practicing. <laughs> I appreciate that. So, boom. Yeah. Uh, before we get into everything, I just wanted to say thank you for coming on the pod. I know it's a busy time for you, basically, like smack dab in the middle of fantasy football off season. So I uh, just wanted to say I appreciate you for taking some time to come on the pod, bro. Of course, man. I'm always down to uh, to chat about different things, whether it's fantasy football, life content, podcasts, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever today takes us towards. I'm, I'm down for it. So I'm happy to be here, man. Thanks for having me on. Of course, bro. Love to hear it. So before we get into like everything else, basically what I do at the beginning of every podcast is like I do this thing called song of the week. Right. And so it's to give my listeners like some new stuff to add to their playlist, because when I have all types of different guests on, like you get all types of different music. So you end up coming up with like a pretty unique playlist. And so basically every week I give a song, my guest gives a song and then I add like i add it to a playlist i haven't released yet so i have the playlist but in like two weeks i'm gonna release like a playlist on twitter it's gonna be a banger so just watch out for it i'm gonna tag you in and everything it's gonna <laughs> be great and so um yeah bro so song of the week what what have you been listening to this week heavy any song any genre any artist yeah so yeah i saw this on the show sheet and i thought this was dope i was like this is really <laughs> really uh like a fantastic idea i'm someone who's like very uh i have a podcast or music playing like 24 7 in the background um, so this, this got me excited. I'm like, yeah, I would definitely <laughs> listen to this playlist. I don't know how it's going to flow with one another, but like, that's kind of how my playlists work too. Like if I have a playlist that I just call now, it's just shit that's stuck in my head and it's exactly it goes anywhere from like sad music to hip hop to blue. You know what I mean? It's all over the mm -hmm. place. So I'd imagine that's what, that, that's what this is going to end up being. Uh, 100%. the song most stuck in my head right now is by a guy named Ty. I don't know if this guy's like actually popular or not. I found him on TikTok. Mm -hmm. His name's Tiberius, T A I. V E R D E S and the song's called I Deserve to Be Alone. It's all Ooh. lowercase. Yeah, yeah. Like it's it's exactly how you think it would feel. So it's <laughs> it's catchy as shit, but it's a it's a sad song. Um I, I like sad songs. I don't know why I like things that make me uh, emotional or move me. And that's this song has just been like in my head for a week or two nonstop. So that will be my addition to the playlist. Boom. Nah, TikTok be having some bangers, bro. There's a lot of bangers on like like songs in the playlist are gonna be from TikTok. Like it's crazy. You just find when you're scrolling, like you just find so much good music. But my song is also one of those like sad songs, one of those like late night drive songs. You just put it on. Everyone has those nights, you feel me? And so mine's called Head Over Hills. Uh it's by this artist called 
Tusi. I think he's from like Syracuse. But yeah, it's like a it's like a in your feelings type of song. So we'll get a nice little vibe to the playlist when these come back to back. You better be sad when you're listening to it. Hell yeah. And so boom. He kind of just get into like before the fantasy football stuff, like just to learn a little bit more about you and like where you come from and like just you as a person. Um, where are you from, bro? Uh, so I was actually born in Brooklyn down in uh, Coney Island. I only lived there for a couple of years. Uh, ended up moving to Jersey with my mom and my sister really young. And we were in Jersey for, I want to say like 25, 24, 25 years. And I eventually moved back into Brooklyn to Williamsburg for a year. I uh, moved into Manhattan for a year after that and then moved downtown still in Manhattan, which is where I'm currently at right now. So I've been in the the tri-state area like yourself pretty much my whole life. And uh, I don't know if I could see myself kind of being anywhere else. I feel that. No, I was like teetering back and forth from maybe trying to move to LA, but like, it's just not the, like I've taken a trip to LA and it's not the same as New York. Like yeah, the, it's a very unique place, experience you get here. Yeah. The one place that I could see myself living outside of this is San Diego. I spent some, some time Ooh. there. Yeah. I almost pulled the trigger a couple of years ago. I was like, this is when I first got into doing all this content stuff. And I was like, Oh, this is cool. I could work from my laptop, whatever. Uh, I was traveling around, uh, traveling around way more than I probably should have at the time. I needed to like get into a routine, mm -hmm. but I ended up in San Diego. I ended up like crashing on my friend's couch for a long ass time. I was like, I'm going to book a one-way ticket. I <laughs> stayed on his couch for like a month and a half, two months. And I started looking at apartments in San Diego and I was like, yo, I love it here so much. And it was, uh, some of the best, like, you know, it, it, it wasn't that long of a time. It was only uh, a month or two, but it was some mm -hmm. of the best experiences I've had. And uh, that always reminds me of San Diego. And I'm like, yo, those are the only two places. It's, it's either New York or San Diego, probably no in between. But now that I'm back here, man, now that the energy's back up in New York. It's it's so, it's hard, it's to so leave. hard to get pulled away from yeah. it. Before, before I ask you the next thing, bro, I just want to say that shirt is fire. The little VDGE shirt, that's gas. You're gonna have to give me uh you're gonna have to give me your address. I'll send you over. I just got like 10 Whoa. samples yesterday. That's crazy. Got you after the show, bro. That's that's Yo. hard. Um, so like how did you first get into fantasy? Like, did you when you were like thinking about building your brand, like did you how did you know that this was kind of what you wanted to to build off of? Uh well, I started playing fantasy when I was young. I was probably like I don't know, 13 or 14 or something. I played in a league with like my friends in my hometown and we would like ride our bikes around our, our town all day, end up at the public library. We'd go on, on Yahoo and like start drafting teams, <laughs> like mock drafts. Real, We'd be like the guys in the leagues that just did 48 different drafts and never actually like participated throughout the I league. Really ever. You know, that's, I'm glad best ball came around now because that kind of solves that problem for exactly. people. Like what we used to do. Um, so we started playing, you know, it was very like normal kids kind of shit. And, uh, we we got our serious league going where we did it year over year over year. And I kept winning. Uh, I probably won like three or four out of the first five or six years. And I was like, yo, I'm like actually kind of good at this stuff. A little I bit of a like, humble brag. you know? Yeah, I was. I, I mean, <laughs> listen, listen, I, I thought I was like good. So I was like, let me spread my wings a little bit. I genuinely feel like I could help people out there. Let me start spreading the the things that I feel like I know about fantasy football. And when I look back on it, like I was so bad, like the things I was saying, make absolutely <laughs> no fucking sense. So it's like a humble brag, but it's also like really embarrassing. Had we had any like evidence of what I was putting out there. So mm -hmm. I started, uh, I started blogging. I, I made a blog first. Uh, I realized pretty quickly that I absolutely like hated writing. It was not for me. It's not what I like to do. I'm much better, you know, in front of a, a microphone, I'm better on camera. That just came way more comfortable to me. Uh, it really, none of this, I'm going to be honest, like none of this stuff was a, a very, very, uh, like laid out vision or plan. When I first started, it was a very genuine, like, yeah, I feel like I could help people in some way or another, I feel like I'm good at this. Let me try to get my message out there. And then it's, it's kind of like a subconscious path of how businesses operate nowadays. It's like, we have a message to get out. How do we reverse engineer it to get out there to the masses? And when I'm, mm -hmm. you know, 17, 18 years old, like, I don't, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I'm just like Googling around, Oh, uh, where can I make videos? How do I make videos? How do I get them out to the masses? You know, what platforms are there for me to experiment with this stuff? So in terms of like building the brand or the business or anything that has come over such a long evolution, uh, of, of like what we've become up until this day. But from the start, it really, it was just like a passion, a, a very pure, genuine passion. No, I feel like, cause I, w I also wanted to ask you like, what did you have like this blue just winging it but like you kind of explain you were just kind of winging it which is kind of like where the some of the greatest stuff comes out of feel me when you're just like going by however you feel like at the moment because it's all genuine you know you you um, gotta wing it from the from the start dude because if you don't have that mm -hmm. like 
when I look back on that, it, it, it shocks me like the pure, like the pure energy and focus and, and genuity I had towards helping other people and like how raw it really was. I'm like, uh-huh. I don't even know if I have that in me anymore. So the fact <laughs> that I did have it when I was like 18, 20 is it was, it, it's such like a welcoming feeling. And knowing that I've had that before, like knowing what that actually feels like is something that I feel you can't really do impactful things without that to begin with. Because if you don't feel that way from the start, it's, it's, it's like, it's destined to fail. Cause you're not mm-hmm. going to push yourself when shit gets really hard. And you know, when you do need to push yourself, like you're going to fall back on telling yourself, like, ah, I don't really care about this that much. I'm not that passionate about it. What, am I here to help people? Am I here to help myself? Am I doing it for the wrong reasons? And like that shit always plays itself out over the long run. So I got in it for the right reasons. And I think realistically, that's why the foundation of everything we're doing has, you know, played out. No, nah, I feel that. Um, so like, where did the, where did like the BDGE name, like big dogs got to eat name come from? And like, why was it important for you to make it a fantasy football lifestyle brand? Like what is, cause like in your, like the YouTube header thing, it says like the first fantasy football lifestyle brand, but like, what does that mean? So, okay. So the name, I think when I started, when I started blogging, I don't even remember what the name of the blog was, to be honest. It was probably something <laughs> like so, some corny play on word with with my name, Nick. And then my YouTube channel, when I started it, still to this day, just Nick or Kalano, just my name. Uh, Big Dogs Gotta Eat came after college. I remember when I, when I started getting serious about like, okay, we need, a, we need a brand name. We need a company name or something. What can I do? And I was like, let me f- figure out something that I feel like represents where I'm at in my life, which is still very much in like about to graduate from college. Uh, but at the same time, I feel uh, compelled to like work really hard for something because I have a vision, I have a passion behind something. Uh, the, the, the elongated story is the fact that uh, we had senior week in college and senior week is like the last <laughs> week before we graduate. And we planned a bunch of these things where it was like a bar crawl, a house party crawl. It was like one each day of the week leading up to graduation was like a different event. So we did all these things. And one of the days was, uh, was beer Olympics. And it was the entire senior class. I went to Marist College. And there was 84 teams in the Beer Olympics. And uh, 84? 84 <laughs> teams in the Beer Olympics. And it was like teams of like eight people. So it was legit like 800 people competing in the <laughs> tournament. And we're rolling through the, the, the rounds, right? Like we you know, win the first round, second round, third round, four, whatever. We're in the semifinals. There's fucking just four, tanks. There's just four tanks. Dude, out of control. Like my, my, my tolerance at this time is like disgusting when I think back <laughs> on it. I was so good at chugging, chugging things. I, I don't really know why I was, I was gifted with it at the time, but we're, we're down to like the final four teams and it's four teams left. And the last event in the beer Olympics is like a boat race. And that's basically like you put your four best players on the table against their four best and you just chug your cup. It's full cup beer, chug your cup as fast as you can. Um, and I was like the anchor, I remember. So I'd be the last one to go on the team and we'd run it. And I remember like in the semifinals game, we got to the end and like something we had been yelling the entire tournament every time we won was big dogs got to eat. It was like uh-huh. a thing that we just started yelling. And like me and my friend group in that six or eight people that were in the beer Olympics just continued yelling that throughout the entire tournament. So when I like slammed the last cup down and we won the thing, I remember us like just like straight up bar. We were hammered, <laughs> right? Because we're like 10 rounds deep. We're like, we're bark. We're like, ooh, 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 big dogs got to eat. Big dogs got to eat. You know, we're screaming it the whole time. And I think back on that and I was like, that's a pretty funny name. I feel like that kind of encapsulates a few things. And when I think about, you know, it's, it's like a silly story, but when I think about uh, big dogs, it's really more of um, people that are, are willing to, put themselves out there and be creative and pursue things that make them uncomfortable and make them vulnerable. Um, and I think that's like the message and the energy I'd like to give off anytime I come onto a podcast or anytime I, I go on camera uh, that I'm 100% myself. And I hope that resonates with other people and like inspires them to also be themselves. And that's who I consider, uh, you know, big dogs. And when I say got to eat, it's more like they're going to eat, right? The people that are willing to step outside of their comfort zone are the ones that are going to be able to push themselves to do things that really like, move the needle that, that push the boundaries that, uh, cause change in the world and, and that do inspire other people. So that's kind of where the name comes from. It comes from a little bit of, uh, the college thing. I was like, Oh, I love that name. It was just like a fun time in my life. And I think it represents like who I am as a person, but it definitely has a little bit of a deeper meaning, um, to me when I get into it. So did y'all win the beer Olympics? Fuck yeah, we won. There we go. That's what yeah. I like to hear. <laughs> that's what I like to hear. And, but not like the thing you were saying about how like being a, because there's a lot of people when you like look at their podcast or their youtube videos like they portray a persona but then when you actually like have a face-to-face convo it's not the same 
but like with you i can already tell like you're the same person on your youtube videos on your podcast that you are talking to me right now so i just think that that's dope bro and so like props to you for that because i just there's no other way to do it i feel like you can't i don't know nowadays if if, if you want to be um if you want to if you're trying to give out value to people it's like you need to be like the bottom line for people as content creators that i think are going to be able to succeed over the next five ten years like the bottom denominator for every single one of them is going to have to be this this type of like authenticity i don't mm -hmm. i don't ever want to have to if if my mom walks in the room right now i'm going to talk to her the same way i'm talking to you if my, <laughs> my best friend walks in the room same thing my sister my uncle my you know what i mean like i'm not someone that's going to like change depending on who walks in the room and i feel like the audience just senses that they know that and they become really comfortable with you really quickly when they know that because they feel like they're they feel like they are on the level of your mom or your brother or your sister or your best yeah. friend or whatever i think it's just so important no i feel like and like i, I already sense like the vibe like is is super like comfortable and like conversation like i love that um like you, what you're like 28 right 27 28 yeah 28 28 boom so like you've been building this brand throughout your 20s like what have you found is like the most rewarding part but also like have you felt like you've had to sacrifice certain things that like other 20 somethings wouldn't uh yeah for sure um tough question yeah i feel like i've been in my 20s for a long time but i feel like i'm <laughs> starting to get up there in age man i'm uh i'm i feel like i'm in the jungle here in manhattan like my mm -hmm. location in my apartment i'm like i think i'm like a little bit too old to be where i'm at right now because of I, i've i've worked so hard to get to to like where i'm at right now um and yeah for sure i've sacrificed things um i've sacrificed a lot of like social events i've sacrificed probably relationships um I've sacrificed a lot of things, but I wouldn't give that up for anything because like when you have a really strong feeling or passion about something, it's like it, 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 you start to value that above those other things, right? It's like a, it's, a, it's a give or take. So uh, the things that I've, I mean, when I really originally left my job, it was because I valued um, my freedom and I valued uh, most importantly, like my, my creativity. And I hated the fact that like when you have a nine to five job, it's like you can only be intellectual and you could only be creative and you can only oh, your hard work needs to be done in this time frame or it doesn't matter. And I'm like, that's such a stupid fucking way to like have the work, uh, have a workforce, you know, like, yeah, it doesn't make sense. And I'm glad that like, honestly, COVID, that was one of the good things that came out of COVID is that reset that it's like, we don't need to be together all the time. We don't need to be on this stupid schedule that doesn't make sense to begin with. I think it's kind of gone to like one side of the spectrum really heavy where it's going to eventually get back to the middle. Um, but yeah, I mean, build, listen, like when you believe so strongly in something, you don't always feel like you're sacrificing in the moment, but looking back, yeah, sure. I'm sure I've, uh, I've sacrificed a lot, but a lot of it feels like it was probably some shallow, uh, sacrifice as well. Like, you know, probably missed some parties, probably missed some things like that, but I'd rather have been chasing what I felt, uh, really strongly about. And obviously I, I kind of made the right decision because now I have the, the freedom and the flexibility to, to live my life how I want. But I would say, you know, when you are like younger coming up, it's really, really difficult to, um, to not put yourself like in a box as, as a creator, you know, you, you kind of get told like what you should be doing or what you shouldn't be doing. And I think one of the biggest things that, that this, this like content thing can really fuck with you is, is the mental aspect of it. Um, even, even when you're free and even when you have this, uh, th this like lifestyle where you can kind of do whatever you want. And I, I I'm, I'm able to like wake up when I want and do whatever I want throughout the day yeah. for the most part, still very mentally draining, man. Cause you're always thinking like, what's the next thing? Like you have to, you have to innovate. Like every single year I have to figure out where I'm making money from. Right. Because uh, some affiliate deals or sponsorships or products or whatever, just don't sell or they don't happen year in and year out. So it's like, uh, it's, it's very tough mentally. And the easiest way to like drive your mental, your mental health down is by like really worrying about what other people are saying or what, you know, how, how they're looking at you or if they're judging you or things like that. So when you're starting off like that, that's the most difficult thing. I think like the first year or two, uh, is definitely a, a mental game. And then after that, it becomes kind of like a physical game, just like how, how hard you're willing to work for it. I feel that. Um, I feel like everybody, like the 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 fact that you're able to just wake up whenever you want and like do what and like work for yourself, I think is the biggest motivational factor. Cause like once you start doing that and you're successful at it, like no one wants to go back to working for someone else. Do you feel me? But like 
everyone feels like they want to do that but like so many people just don't go for it and so like for you to go for it like that's dope bro for you to like quit your job and like actually like jump out on that ledge and like make it work for yourself is pretty sick um it's, and it's yeah i mean like it, it never really felt like um not to sound like weird, but like it, it never really felt like I had a choice. Like when I was working at my jobs, it always it got to the point where when I left, it was I left because I had to like I, I couldn't like I couldn't really breathe at my job. I was like, this is suffocating me. And I'm I'm like 22, 23 years old. I, I can't hey. be sitting here. Yeah. Like I can't be sitting here <laughs> wasting fucking 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day doing something that's literally getting me nowhere in life. Meaningless, and like, meaningless. Yeah. Like I have other things that I'm, I'm excited about or passionate about. Why would I waste my time on this? I also, you know, you have to look at where you're at subjectively in life too. I, uh, I didn't have like a lot of responsibilities at the time. I was still living at home with my mom. So it wasn't like I was paying rent or wasn't like I was paying a mortgage or anything. Speaking of my mom, there she is <laughs> checking up on me. Even at, yeah, even at 28, she's always worried about me. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, I had been working full time for three, four years or whatever, saving up money. So when I did make the leap to leave my job, I had already been building up some of this, uh, a little bit of an audience on the social side of things. I had financial backings, plus didn't have a lot of expenses because I live with my mom. So it's a very different equation for a lot of people. So making mm -hmm. the jump has to be a subjective thing to you, right? Like you can, it's, you're always going to go on fucking Instagram or TikTok or whatever and see somebody that's younger than you, more famous than you, got more money than you, taller than you, better looking than you, fat, you know, all those fucking things. It's going to happen every single time you open up those apps, you start comparing yourself to those people, like that's when you're going to fucking lose. So you I can't do it. Like you can't, can't do it. Yourself. Yeah. You got to be real aware about your situation and then kind of work from that. Exactly. Nah, a hundred percent. And like, before we get into like the fantasy stuff, I just wanted to say like, I read like your ode to the roaring twenties, like a while ago. And I know you said you're not like a writer, bro, but that shit was inspirational, my boy. <laughs> that that shit was fire. That was like the, one of the only blog posts I've written in the last like 10 years. I am, I am actually pretty, pretty proud of that. I think I just sat down one day, kind of blacked out, wrote the entire fucking thing. And it, it came out pretty, uh, pretty well. I just had a lot on my chest, I guess, when I wrote that. And I was like, this is fucking literally, that was like everything I've learned over the last 10 years. So I'm glad, <laughs> glad I was able to help somebody. Of course, bro. And so like, yeah, we can kind of just like pivot into the, to, to the fantasy stuff. Um, so like the big thing right now in the whole fantasy community is, uh, unfortunately Cam Akers injury, uh, the, the season ending Achilles is just, horrible news everyone's hype on the daryl henderson train where do you stand bro um obviously like it's it's tough i know you were big on cam makers and so what uh, <laughs> brutal brutal yeah like I, I could talk about this for in, in like 17 different angles right now he was on almost all my dynasty teams I gave up a whole lot of capital for him um he was like one of my guys i've been hyping up for the last like three months in in season long leagues I know on your sheet, you had some must draft, must own guys for the year. Like he would have been my number one pick. Mm -hmm. uh, so this shit hurt, man. This shit, this shit hurt a lot. And, uh, and now I'm sitting here thinking about the Ram situation. And like, for the same reason that I like Cam Akers, I think you got to like Darrell Henderson. I don't think he's as talented. He doesn't have like the size necessarily. I don't, I don't think he'll be a three down workhorse, but the situation is pretty fucking sexy. So I, I'd say where I, where I'd jam him into is probably a consistent low end RB two. I, I can't imagine a situation where they don't get another back involved. Where and I was going to say that. I yeah, was going to say that too. For Cam Akers, I could have seen a situation where he was getting 70 to 75% of the touches, but like Henderson probably bordering around like 60. I don't know if it's going to be Xavier Jones. I don't know if they're going to bring in like a a veteran running back or something, but I'm definitely not as high on Henderson as I was for for Akers. I thought Akers had like unbelievable upside this year. No, nah, I'm with you. Um, I don't exactly buy into the whole Sean McVay saying that they're confident and Daryl Henderson gave him the keys to the to the Ferrari of the run game. Like, I don't exactly believe that. But I mean, I guess we'll see as the offseason goes along, whether or not they bring in someone else. Um, I 100 percent agree. I don't think he's going to get the, the, the type of workload that I thought Cam Akers was, was going to get. Like I had Cam Akers like the back of my first round, like early second. Um, Daryl Henderson, I, like I just don't. But I like you said, I don't think the talent is there. You just don't. Yeah, I just don't. Like it's just it's, yeah. it's simple as that. Um, I mean, his actions speak louder than words. I feel like they've sh they could have given Daryl Henderson so much work so many different times, and it just never. It was never exactly. Thing, you know exactly. Um, and so yeah, like you like you kind of mentioned that is the perfect segue into like the whole um, 
So like, I want to know from you, cause everyone has those guys that like, they must, they can't leave the draft without you feel me. I ha- I know I have mine. One in particular, my guy, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to tell who it is if you know what my name is. And then, um, uh, I so like, I would like to know like who's three guys you can't leave your draft without. And then like three guys that you want no parts of. And then like, I'll kind of do the same. All right. So in the first round, I think, um, Zeke is a guy I'd imagine I'm going to have a lot of shares of because Mm -hmm. he's starting to drop into like the end of the first, early second round. If you're in a super flex league, he keeps falling down the draft boards. I think uh, people have this narrative that he's washed. I think most of everything that came out of last year with Zeke, and you talk about his numbers and his stats, had everything to do with Dak getting hurt and had everything to do with the entire offensive line getting hurt. But their O-line is healthy this year. I think PFF has them ranked top five entering the year. Dak's obviously healthy again. Uh, in those four or five games where Dak was on the field last year. I mean, they're the number one paced offense in the NFL, have been for two years. So uh, Zeke was on pace for almost 90 targets. That's like that's legit like Saquon type numbers right there. Yeah. So even if you think he fell off a little bit as a rusher, which I don't really think is the case. I think it was it, it was the uh, it was the O-line getting banged up. This the situation. Offense is, right. Yeah, this offense is going to be so fluid, bro. It's going to be fireworks in Dallas all day long. So I'm I'm really in on a, a big bounce back for for Zeke this year. Some other must draft guys like so I want I want one of the two pieces on the Chargers offense. Another offense I think is just gonna be straight fireworks. It's is Austin Eckler and Keenan Allen. Um, both of them with Herbert under center. They have like the most improved offensive line in the NFL this year. They signed all pro Corey Lindsley. They draft for Sean Slater. They're bringing a couple other guards that are pretty highly graded. Uh, and, and it's just Austin Eckler is already like one of the most efficient running backs in the NFL. And now you give yeah. him an O-line to work with. Now you give him a quarterback that's going to stretch the field with his arm. Um, hopefully a little bit more goal line action too, because Anthony Lynn is out of the picture. He was on target for, uh, he was on pace for like 114 targets last year with Herbert as a quarterback. <laughs> Insane. And then Keenan Allen, you flip that switch and he was on pace for like 180 targets last year with Herbert under center. So it's like, dude, you could do no wrong. This, this offense, there's, I don't see a way that they disappoint with Herbert coming into his second year, full starter, new coach, new offensive line, like fucking wheels up for everybody in LA. <laughs> no, I'm with you, bro. Uh, I'm super high on Canela and Austin. I go, hell, I'm, I'm, and Herbert, I'm high on Mike Williams. Like, I, I just the Chargers. I'll, get, I'll grab some fucking anyone you want to throw into that LA <laughs> offense, bro. Put them on the squad. Jared That's what Cook, I'm saying. Fuck it. Cook it up. Let's go. Let's go. 100%, bro. I'm down for everybody on the Chargers. Um, so like, I my must draft guy 100% is Najee Harris. One, he's my namesake. Two, <laughs> like, like, you gotta put on for the name. And so, like, for everyone else that I'm gonna say, I'm kind of just gonna go like super, like, kind of give like a couple bullet points. But I gotta get on my soapbox for Najee because it go. must be done. So, like, the 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 num like the two best things for me about drafting Najee is the value that he brings and the volume. Um, right now, like, we're going off underdog ADPs, so right now he's currently the 13th running back off the board. Um, I feel like we're drafting him at his floor, to be honest. I feel like the concerns, the issues that people have, I feel like they're kind of priced in. And I feel like we can kind of think CEH for that last year. Um, people were super high on Clyde and like, I'm not going to say I was one of them, but like I was high on Clyde, just not as high as everyone else. Like he was Andy Reese guy, Mahomes guy, first round running back came off that LSU chip team. Like, all systems were go for Clyde. He ended up finishing as the RB22. They bought 11. Things got a little messy. And so, like, according to, like, Fantasy Football Calculator, uh, he was being drafted, like, the 108, the seventh RB off the board, which is wild. And so, like, he was kind of a bust in terms of where you drafted him. I think that Najee this year could be a legitimate league winner. I feel like the upside is huge. I feel like everybody that talks about fantasy – talks about volume volume is king everyone knows that um and so i think Najee's gonna get a lot of it uh i think mike tomlin's proved time and time again that he's willing to like run a running back into the ground and make them a workhorse uh since 2014 the steelers top back has averaged like 86.6 percent of their fantasy points everyone knows how much lev touched the ball and then even when lev went down d'angelo williams was a fantasy god <laughs> so like i feel like it's not that hard to to kind of project that for Najee and and so he's also a really great pass catcher. Um, and I understand that everyone always talks about the offensive line. That's the, the number one issue. The Steelers have a shit offensive line. You could put me, you, Snacks, Animal, and Seth Rogen out there, and we would block just the same, according to everyone else, right? And so, like, they don't have a great line. I get that. But, like, running backs have produced with bad O-lines before. If we just take into account last year, James Robinson finishes the RB7. The Jags were literally 
the shittiest team in the league. And PFF had them ranked as a bottom 10 O-line both this year, like go upcoming off, and last year. You know I mean? Dalvin Cook was the RB3 last year. Obviously, the talent discrepancy is there but like the vikings had the 26th ranked o-line david montgomery and josh jacobs the rb6 and the rb8 last year both bears and raiders o-lines were pretty shit bottom 12 you know what the one thing they had in common was they were all top six in total touches amongst running backs since 2010 steelers running backs have averaged 432 touches and the starting back has averaged 333 of those touches when they've missed four games or less that would have been the third in the NFL last season behind only Dalvin Cook and Derrick Henry. Josh Jacobs and David Montgomery are the only other two to have 300 plus touches. So I'm if you sold, give, bro. I'm so if you give him 300 <laughs> touches, you feel me? Like he's gonna be a top, he could be like a top five running back. And so that's the type of upside I think Najee has. Fuck the O line. I'm drafting him on every team I got. <laughs> All right. I feel that I'm, 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 I'm so, you know what? He was someone that right after the NFL draft, I was basically beating the same drum. And then I've cooled down a little bit just because I'm, I'm worried about the Pittsburgh offense overall, just moving. Like, I don't, I don't want all of his touches to be empty calorie touches where they're just like, you know, three yard fucking plows between uh, the (laughs) 30 yard line. And then you have 15 of those. You're like, Oh, we got the volume, but he had 64 rushing yards. You don't get the goal line attempt, but he is a great pass catcher too. It's not just a, he's not just like a big thick bruiser. That's only on the field for, for rushing downs. He should get the first down work, second down work, third down work. So the volume should be crazy. I, uh, I, I'm I'm probably going to be getting a couple of shares of Najee myself. Boom. And then, uh, kind of my second guy, um, I feel like people are super down on him just because he had a really shit year last year. His name is the one and only Mr. Michael Thomas. Uh, 2019, he was an absolute god. He set the record for most catches in a season, 1,700 plus receiving yards. Everybody knows all that. He sprained his ankle week one, and his entire season was fucked after that. With all of that standing, though, he still had the fourth highest target share of any wide receiver in the league when he was on the field, and he led the league in air yards. The QB change, I know between Taysom Hill and Jameis Winston, there are no Drew Brees. But, like, if we already – I'm not really worried about Jameis. I feel like Jameis has shown us he's going to let that thing fly. So, like, we Michael Thomas – he's going to get Michael Thomas the ball. With Taysom Hill, in those – from weeks 10 to 13, when Taysom Hill was primarily the quarterback, here were Michael Thomas's target numbers, 12, 6, 11, and 8. And for the sixth target game, he was a decoy. He only played 67% of the snaps. And so I feel like, and they let Emmanuel Sanders walk and he had 19.5% of their targets. So now those are just vacant. And who else is in the, the wide receiver room for the saints? Like um, I, I can't even remember his name. People were super high on him last year. Trey Kwan. Like, yes, yes, yes. Trey they'll, make, they'll make up any fucking number of <laughs> names out there to pretend that they got a wide receiver too in New Orleans, bro. That's what I'm saying. Like Trey Kwan Smith isn't that guy. He's not. And between he's not that guy, pal. He's no not way. that guy, pal. And so between Kamara and Michael Thomas, like Michael Thomas is gonna get his. Whether it's Taysom, Jameis, I don't care who's back there, they're gonna give Michael Thomas the ball. He's just too good as a separator. I'm with you. I mean, his whole season was fucked last year because of the high ankle sprain and other injuries, and it is what it is. I don't think it's going to matter who's under uh, who's under center for the Saints this year. My, Michael Thomas is getting 30 percent of the targets. He's getting 40 percent of the air yards. Like you don't you don't really need to say more. Boom. Um, I wanted to ask you, bro. What's your thoughts on Tyler Lockett? This is a tough one. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm working on a, I'm working on a piece of content where I'm looking at different like teammates, different wide receiver teammates on the same team and and which ones I'm kind of hedging, which ones I'm probably going to pass on and whatnot. I haven't got to the Seahawks and Tyler Lockett. I am very high on DK Metcalf. I'm also I'm, I'm probably getting back around to, to Lockett. He was a guy I drafted in a lot of spots last year and realistically he had like three or four good games. And uh, finishes like the wide receiver 10 overall, but his consistency was so, so Horrible. bad. Horrible. Yeah, th- I, I feel like this has been the case uh, with Seattle almost every year over the last four years. They have a stretch. It's either the first half or the second half. Like Russ either starts on fire and then cools off dramatically over the second half or starts off cool goes nuts over the second half of the year. And that's going to coincide with how the wide receivers do as well. So I feel like a lot of people have this down opinion on – lock it but dk metcalf was amazing first half of the year last year not that good the second half of the year it was the same thing so i'm trying to look at this situation objectively and just say tyler lockett tied to one of the most accurate quarterbacks in the history of the nfl in seattle and russell wilson uh they just extended him 
So he's clearly a very big part of this passing offense. When you look at the moves that they made this offseason, uh, they bring in a new offensive coordinator who's talked about going up tempo, up tempo, up tempo, which is going to mean more passing volume. And his, uh, you know, Russ's efficiency is crazy. Anytime you give him volume, he's going to go nuts in the fantasy stats. So uh, they, they draft Dwayne Eskridge and, and uh, they sign Gerald Everett, which you could look at and say, hey, it's target competition. But it also says to me that they're looking to be a more pass heavy offense. So, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with Tyler Lockett where he's going in drafts. I'm not going to say he's like a target of mine, but he's not a guy I'm fading just because he had uh, a few bad games last year. No, I feel that. And so like with, with, um, with, I, I, I know a lot of people are thinking like, Oh, the Seahawks are not going to, they're going to pass as much as they did last year. Um, because they like kind of let Russ cook, but they really only had 34.7. Like they, they, Pass attempts per game. That's how many uh, attempts the Seahawks average per game when it comes to the passing game. They did sign a new offensive coordinator, Shane Waldron from the Rams. He spent three seasons as their pass game coordinator, and they never had a pass. Uh, they never attempted less passes than 35.5. So Russ actually might pass more. And if he does, and I feel like that can only mean good things for both DK and Tyler Lockett. Um, yeah, the other thing there too is like um, if they go more up tempo. A lot of that is going to be quick, short hitting passes, and that favors a guy like Lockett because you got DK just doing that every time. You got Lockett <laughs> doing that every time. So it's like they're doing up tempo, boom, 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 boom. It's going to be a lot of Lockett might have a, bu- a bunch of like eight for sixty four games, but in any kind of PPR move, like mm-hmm. you're you're cool moving that way. Yeah, you're you're chilling with that. Um, kind of like the last guy that that I really like. Um, I went running back, wide receiver. So I wanted to go tight end. I feel like I, I always there's always like those super hype tight ends, like the sleepers. Uh, and I feel like this is one of them. Unfortunately, I usually like to go against the grain, but for this one, I was sold. Uh, Tyler Higby, I'm a really, really big fan of. Okay. Uh, the number one thing for me was the opportunity. Gerald Everett is gone. They ha- and like Jacob Harris is competition, but um, I don't think that he's going to be that much of a competition, like that much competition for Higby. Uh, they did give him a four year, 31 mil extension, showed some type of faith in him during his 2019 stretch. He was a god without Gerald Everett for those last four games, even though those four games made up like the vast majority of his fantasy points that year uh, in eight games without Gerald. Those, Everett, those five games are like 35% <laughs> of his career receiving yards. I feel hundred like percent. No, no, no. You're not wrong at all. <laughs> In eight games without him, Gerald Everett, since 2017, Higby would have had a 16-game pace of like 116 targets, 90 receptions, 1,008 yards, 10 touchdowns. Would have been the tight end three in 2020. Um, I know that that always doesn't, like when you extrapolate numbers like that without any context, it doesn't always like lend to the player situation. But like in this situation, I feel like it kind of does. Uh, he's he's And so like he's also one that whose ADP shifts depending on where you're drafting a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, like on underdog, he's a tight end eight. On fantasy pros, he's a tight end 16. So like it really shows like on underdog, obviously the drafts are way more competitive because people are like giving their actual money to do them. And so I feel like he could be a steal come draft day, depending on what the type of league you're drafting. He'll definitely in. be going closer to the, the tight end, like 15 range, I think, in most normal, like friends and family leagues. The underdog ADP is just like out of control. It's like anytime, <laughs> it's like Evan Silva says one thing and the guy shoots up 100 <laughs> spots in the ADP. And, and they, yeah, they love Tyler Higby over there. So, that, I mean, that's the main reason why he keeps shooting up. Exactly. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm a big Tyler Higby guy. I feel like I have a couple more like tight end targets and I know my league mates are going to listen to this and they're definitely going <laughs> to s- steal Higby from me, but it's all right. Cause you know, I got him in the bag. Um, and so, yeah, did you have anyone else that you were like super high on? Um, what are your thoughts on Miles Sanders this year, bro? Bro, I, well, I was <laughs> I was waiting for you to switch over to the, to the guys that we are not leaving our fucking drafts with because <laughs> Miles Sanders broke my heart in, uh in more ways than than any amount of girlfriends can break my heart last year <laughs> and uh i you still need to listen to that have, playlist bro but that's what i'm saying bro that i was getting prepared for this podcast and that's why ty veritas was on my playlist because i knew i was gonna <laughs> have to talk about miles sanders he would have had a big year last year if the o-line didn't get hurt if he didn't get hurt but you you, you have a very small margin for error in the nfl and his time as a workhorse, I feel like, is up already. They're kind of telling us what they want to do. And they didn't bring anyone that's like a big name in, but you're hearing the running backs coach, you're hearing the offense coordinator saying, uh, we're, we're not committing to a feature workhorse. You know, we got to have guys that catch passes. We got to have guys that block. We got to have bigger guys that work on the goal line. All that tells me is that it's going to be a committee. Like, they're already telling us it's a committee right now. So I'm not about to draft a, a running back. Like, last year, I believed it wasn't going to be a committee. And mm-hmm. when he got hurt, 
the first like four or five games, it wasn't. He was averaging like 25 opportunities a game. And then he got hurt again, and then he lost that chance. But now they're telling us that it's going to be a committee, and they bring in uh, on Johnson. They re-sign Jordan Howard. They draft Kenneth Gainwell. Uh, they got, you know, they have like six running backs. None of them are actually good, but they're all there, right? It's more, <laughs> of a, more of a volume than a, than an efficiency game over there, but it just means that they're all going to have specific roles. So Sanders is the best running back in that backfield without a doubt. And I, I'm, I'm assuming he'll get a bunch of first and second down work. He'll have his big games because he breaks off 70 yard, 75, 80 yard runs every once in a while. I'm just not sold on how involved he is in the passing game. I don't know what they do on the goal line. I don't know if that offense is going to go to absolute shit. I like Jalen Hurts, <laughs> but there's always a chance I could be wrong on that. And if I am wrong, you don't want the starting running back in a committee on a bad offense. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of red flags when it comes to Miles Sanders. The player that you like, he's talented, but I think the opportunity that he could have been a workhorse back kind of eluded him last year. And I don't think he gets that chance back. No, I'm I'm with you. Miles Sanders is definitely a, a guy that I'm fading. Like, and I didn't have him last year. I wanted him last year though, but I just ended up not getting him. Good um, for you. <laughs> Good for fucking you. <laughs> so, like, our the reason I didn't get him, our league does like we do like draft, we do a live draft, we do draft pick trades, and so I had I had two second round picks and not a third, and I and I had two early seconds. So by the time I picked again, he just wasn't there. Um, this year I have two firsts, so you know I'm really gonna try and. Bowl so now, this. now you're gonna use one of those on Miles Sanders, right? Exactly. No, I'm, <laughs> I have eight and eleven. Miles Sanders at eight. 100%. Miles Sanders, Najee Harris. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> um, and so uh, basically talking about guys we don't like. Um, mine's just kind of a, a situation. I'm not a big fan, and I have it here in the notes. It says th- these two running backs slash Miles Sanders. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Um, the Jacksonville, the Jacksonville backfield of James e- Robinson Etienne was my next guy up, bro. And Travis Etienne. Yeah. I, I'm not a big fan. Uh, you could, you could do Etienne. I'll do Robinson, uh, for James Robinson. I feel like he was really good last year. He was incredible. You just burst onto the scene out of nowhere. Unfortunately, the coaching regime that he impressed is no longer there. Uh, and one of the first things that Urban Meyer did, signed Carlos Hyde and then went and took a first round running back at Travis Etienne. So they haven't shown much faith in him. Um, but I do feel like he's more of a value than Travis Etienne. Uh, not only, like I said, they, they signed Carlos Hyde. He literally said he wants the whole one-two punch with, Tra- with Etienne as the third down back. And so what made James Robinson so successful last year was all that volume. And now that we've taken it away, he's really not that attractive of a pick to me. And like even the goal line carries aren't guaranteed because I know damn well they're going to throw Carlos Hyde's big <laughs> ass in there and yeah. he's going to ram it into the goal line. So I feel, you know. And the other problem too is like Trevor Lawrence is a very mobile quarterback. Like he could do a Josh Allen, which people underrate. I feel like like if Trevor Lawrence finishes this year with five or six rushing touchdowns, I wouldn't be surprised. No, but the whole uh, Jacksonville offense is probably going to run for. 12 10 rushing touchdowns and that's a huge fucking portion of them if that were to happen and travis Etienne like falls in the same mold as miles sanders where they're already telling you that they're going to be using a committee why are you using like a fourth round pick a fifth round pick on a committee back that you have no idea like here's the thing with Etienne too it's not even like he has goal line upside right like if trevor lawrence has zero rushing touchdowns this year there's a much better chance that james robinson and carlos hyde combined for 10 than travis Etienne gets more than four and yeah mm-hmm. he's a great pass catcher like full ppr i'm a little bit higher on etn but I still feel like this offense is fucking too weird for me to dip my hands into because I think we're gonna start <laughs> using all these players in different molds. Like you, you look at um, you look at uh, who's who's the fucking uh, head coach right now? Urban Meyer. Yeah, Urban Meyer and like what he's done with like Percy Harvins and what he's done with all those uh, Curtis Samuel's like weapon type players. Mm-hmm. I feel like we're just gonna get eight to ten touches out of Travis Etienne. Some some weeks it's gonna be twenty two yards. Some weeks it's gonna be seventy six yards. I'm sure, he'll have like a couple big games because good players do that. I think Travis yeah. Etienne is a really good running back, but like the situation screams not to use an early round pick on it. We get we get so hyped up about these early round running back picks, and if they're not guys like Najee, where you know like we, we know Najee's going into a twenty touch twenty touch role, right? Like nobody's denying it if anyone's not on the Najee bandwagon it's because they're not high on the offense they're not high on the offensive yeah. line but we know he's getting 20 touches with etn like he's very much like miles sanders is rookie year like deandre swift jk dobbins cam Akers, all these rookie running backs we love the talent we just we get over excited about pushing the talent into a starting role and it tends not to happen until like week 10 11 12 so if you're cool with using your four, fourth fifth round pick on a guy that might explode in week like 10 go for it but that's just like not not how i'm getting down with my draft
and I feel like a lot of people are just scared of missing out on the breakout. Like, yes, they, they don't want to miss out on that first year breakout. So they're like, fuck it. Like, I'm taking him now. If he breaks out, I'm I'm a superstar. If he doesn't, then we'll try again next year. I'm personally OK with missing out on the breakout. Like, if he's super nice this year, cool. I'll just take him next year. I also <laughs> like, just don't I don't even think he has like a path to like the he doesn't have a path to goal line work. And that is so important in fantasy football, right? There's just so many other players on that roster that are more equipped to handle the goal line work. So if you told me that like they traded James Robinson, then I'd be like, okay, okay. now we have something to talk exactly. about where Travis Etienne is like a third round pick or something like that. But even, even if he gets 60, 50% of the snaps and he's catching, you could tell me he's catching 60 to 70 passes this year. How many touchdowns can we project him to score still like five, you know, and that that's, exactly. that's, that's just not upside for me. No, um, and that kind of leads us to my second guy. My second guy that I'm not high on at all is Mr. Juju Smith Schuster. Um, I feel is, like is anybody uh, high on Juju at this that's point? That's what I'm saying. Like, I feel like, but the people that are, I feel like it's the like the Odell Beckham syndrome. I was like, just about to say, can we throw OBJ and Juju like in the <laughs> same fucking mold here and just yes. get them out the picture? Yes, please, please, please. So Odell, Juju, like they remember the talent and they remember seeing what they could be and what they could have been, and like the name carries more hype than the actual player produces. Uh, had he signed somewhere else, like like had Juju not went back to the Steelers, maybe I would have been a little higher on him, but that's not the case. And so he's still sharing targets with an emerging Deontay Johnson, who I personally love, and Chase Claypool on top of now having a true workhorse and Najee Harris. Like things aren't really He's the fourth up. best player on his offense. He 100%. Went from, he went from being like the dynasty wide receiver one two years ago to being the fourth best player on like a, a mediocre offense. You know, it's, it's crazy. It's, ugly. it's crazy. And so like last season, he had the lowest depth of target of the three wide receivers. He was like five and a half and he got 8.6 yards per catch. What the fuck am I doing with a five point, like five and a half depth of target? Like, what do you, you need like 74 targets to have a good That's game. what I'm saying. Like, come on now. And so, yeah, he fit, he was, a wide receiver 22 last year and he, he like he struggled when it came to man and press he was pretty good in zone but like when it come came to man and press he wasn't that great and yeah i just i'm just not i don't see it with juju i think there is like with every player there's value to be had like if you're taking him as like the wide receiver 50 or some shit then obviously he's going to produce on that but if you're high on juju if you're taking him as like a top 25 guy i could very well see him not finishing inside the top 25 wide receivers yeah i'm, I'm also I'll, I'll throw some some uh some bread on the on the sides of the sandwich so we get out of the ru- running back and wide receiver conversation for a second but joe burrow is a guy um I, I play in all super flex leagues so like quarterbacks are obviously very important joe burrow is a guy where i feel like the offseason is filled with so much like dynasty and rookie talk that we get so excited about these dudes and for sure joe burrow is, is the face of this franchise and since he but i don't think his redraft value reflects what we should project for this year. Like right now on underdog, he's going off the board as the one, two, three, four, five, ninth quarterback right now. He's ahead of Tom Brady, Ryan Tannehill, Stafford, Aaron Rodgers. And I'm like, that's, that's absurd. Like Tom Brady just, threw, that's absurd. Tom Brady just threw for 4,600 yards and 40 fucking touchdowns. And you're going to take Burrow ahead of him quietly too. Like it was a quiet, so, so like- quiet. And now it's the second year in this Arians offense. And it's not even it's not even so much like I love I, I do like all these guys above Burrow, but one of the things that's enticing about Burrow is his mobility, right? Like he, he was he was gonna run for a sneaky 350 and four touchdowns, but he's coming off this ACL tear and yo. Yo. You still there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, I lost your picture. Oh are we good now? Oh, it's down I'm here. Coming that's, in. I, that shit always horrible. fucks with me, bro. <laughs> that's horrible, but whatever. We can't let it rock. You good? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, so Burrow, like one of the things I think that excited us as a prospect, he's, he has that like sneaky athleticism, right? Add that on. Because he's not, listen, he's not thrown for 4,600 and 40 touchdowns, right? Like Tom Brady's probably going to give us again this year. So you need that rushing ability if you're going to be drafting him above him. And I'm like, he's nine months removed from an ACL tear. He was uh, getting hit as much as any quarterback in the NFL. And they made some moves on their offensive line, but they're not like an above average offensive line. He's still going to be taking a bunch of hits. I like the weapons they brought in, but like to expect Joe Burrow to take this it, it, leap from where he was last year to like Tom Brady, Ryan Tannehill levels. Now I feel like it's just, it's just it's a huge leap. It's a lot. to expect. It's so much projection. It's just like, Oh, I like Joe Burrow as a prospect. He's going to be a fantasy star. Let me draft him like that. I'm like, dude, we got a lot to see before that happens. No, I'm with you. And so like, remember I, uh, in the little show notes thing, I had mentioned to you that like I had a couple of listener questions and like 
since you mentioned Superflex, one of them was like, what's the appeal to Superflex? Because like one of the people, like one of the people that had asked me, they're in a, like in our, in, in their home league, like it's just a regular, it's a two flex half PPR league. And like some people want to switch to Superflex, super some don't. So like, what would you say is the appeal of a Superflex league? First off, I would say like you'll never speak to someone who goes to Superflex and wants to go back. All right. It's one of those things <laughs> in life. Like very there are a few things in life where where you switch to it and you're like, I'm never going back to it. Superflex mm-hmm. is one of those. What it does is it opens up a lot of different things within your league in terms of like engagement. One, the draft opens up like pretty, pretty tremendously because obviously quarterbacks start to become valuable, a lot more valuable. So they go earlier in rounds, meaning you get a lot of, you get more flexibility in the draft, right? Cause you get a lot of good skill players later, like your favorite running back who's going, you know, Najee Harris could be a third round pick now in super flex drafts. The other important thing is that it opens up the trade market. Like, tremendously because you add another piece and a lot of fantasy leagues quarterbacks don't really matter tight ends don't really matter so you're not trading those guys but you throw quarterbacks in and it allows for you to trade a lot more different types of players because now you could swap a quarterback for a running back say you drafted three quarterbacks some guys second quarterback gets hurt you can flip them because if he has three running backs when normally no one's no one's going to go running back for quarterback right no one's going to go probably running back for wide receiver because everyone likes running backs but quarterbacks start to have this value that's almost uh parallel to the running back position so it opens up the trade market it opens up the drafting market the flexibility there uh it opens up the waiver wire a little bit the smaller your league is the more likely it is to have more quarterbacks on the wire but overall i mean it just makes the league a lot more fun and it's the same way that like when you switch from standard scoring to half ppr it makes the player pool bigger and it makes mm-hmm. a lot more players exciting to pick. Um, there's more strategy behind it. Same thing. I always think that we should be evening out all the player positions. That's why I'm like, I've been more and more into tight end premium. A lot of the leagues that I do now are tight end premium where they get a little bit extra on the PPR. A couple settings that I've done this off season, I've done a few dynasty startups and we do like a tiered PPR. So it's super flex. Ooh, okay. And we go half PPR for running backs full for wide receivers and 1.5 for tight ends. So it's like really evening Uh out the playing fields where it's like, yeah, we like running backs, but like wide receivers, you're starting three of them rather than two. So the positional scarcity is a little bit less. And now tight ends get like an extra bump. So I think like evening out all of the positions throughout your fantasy lineups makes it more fun because you get to attack it with such a, uh, such a different strategy. So I I could not advocate for super flex more, more than fucking more than miles Sanders last year. (laughs) And that shit hurts. I feel that. I feel that. I feel it, bro. Um, kind of the last little segment that I that we I wanted to do fantasy wise, like so. In the little draft, the the little note thing that I sent you, it was I had draft or pass, right? And so it was super hard to come up with a name still to this day. So I went tuck or untuck. You feel me? Because with the whole shirt tuck, that's what Let's we go. do in the day. Let's go. That's what we do in the day. So. I'm going to give you, well, I'm going to give us two players from rounds one to 10. And we're going to say whether we're tucking, if you tuck, that basically means you're tucking your shirt and you're ready to draft them and come draft day, you're down for whatever. If you're untucking, that means you're getting messy. You want no part to do no, no parts of that player. You want nothing to do with them. I love it. So boom, we just start with round one and round one was kind of difficult because I feel like everyone's a tuck, like in round one, it's hard to find a bad player. So I tried to find someone that's like controversial, I guess. I went with Jonathan Taylor. Um, I don't know if you want to say it at the same time, if you want to go first I th- or I go first, like what, what you want to do here? Um, let's, <laughs> let's go. Th- let's do it at the same time. All right, cool. Actually, so, wait, I don't know if we're, are we de- I don't know if we're delayed. I don't think we're delayed. I don't think we're delayed. All right. So I'll do three, two, one. Say it right. All, All right, right. Cool. Yeah. All right, cool. So Jonathan Taylor, three, two, one. Tuck. Untuck. Oh, I untucked it. Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. The, the more I've thought about it, the more uh, I'm I'm not as likely. You know what? With the Cam Akers news, though, I, I, he's a running back that probably jumps up a little bit for me now and maybe gets into the draftable range. Uh, he. It's just. It's just. There was a lot of. He was a guy like a rookie last year where you couldn't start him until like week 10 or week 11. He finally took off and it was against like the absolute worst, worst defenses shittiest of in the defenses NFL. Ever. And, it, and you're left wondering, was it just the uh, elite prospect finally, you know, getting his feet into his cleats or was it just bullshit schedule? Is he actually like ready to take on a workhorse role? A lot of me says yes, but there are still a lot of like red flags there with Naeem Hines taking the passing work. Carson Wentz is there instead of Rivers, so there's going to be less dump-offs and screens. Marlon Mack is coming back from the Achilles. We'll see if that 
uh, does him any good, but I still think there's a little bit left to be desired from, from Taylor's 2021 outlook. So for me, this was a guy that I was, so like I told you in my actual home league, I have the eighth pick. Right. And so I was going back and forth on whether or not I believe in Jonathan Taylor, because I don't think they've done anything this offseason to prove to you that he's the guy, but you have to draft him like he is the guy. Right. And, and so it, it's tough for me. Like you said, it was a tale of two halves for him from weeks one to 10. He was the RB 18. And then from week 10 on, he was the RB three. So what half do you believe? I'm going to choose to believe it was three. I mean, it was, it was the, it was the second half. Um, I think that he's just like, he has that, that pedigree. He's a top prospect. I feel like he proved to Frank Reich and that coaching staff, at least like, give me the rock and I will make things happen for us. I don't know what Carson Wentz is going to be like. Like you said, the dump off, like if Carson Wentz is a disaster, then it's going to look tough, but I'm going to believe in Jonathan Taylor this year. I do want to ask you though, Jonathan Taylor and Nick Chubb. I will take I'll probably take Taylor there. Mm. Okay. I'm I would take Taylor too. Um Jonathan Taylor or Austin Eckler. What type of league? Half PPR. I'll probably take Eckler. Ooh. I feel like that's a hot take. Is it? You think it is? I feel I, like I, it might be. I've been getting really, really high on Eckler. <laughs> I think it might be. <laughs> I don't know. The more I look into this Chargers offense, the more I'm just like, "There's uh, Eckler seems fail proof this year. He just seems like um, the floor of of what he's going to do is so fucking high." And I think he has a little, you know, Christian McCaffrey to his game, Aaron Jones to his game, where 200 carries would propel him to like top three, top five fantasy running back. I feel that. No, I'm with you. I'm I'm with you, bro. I could very well be talked into an untuck for Jonathan Taylor, hundred percent. I'm not sold. I'm not <laughs> <Okay>. sold. <laughs> the the next guy is also I feel like a, a kind of controversial. Uh, Saquon Barkley. Some people are treating him treating him like his name is Matt Barkley. Others <laughs> they're they're super down. So you want to go same time again? Yeah. All right. Three, <laughs> two, one, tuck. Can tuck this shit in. Let's go. Yeah, Barkley's, yeah. Barkley's getting that tuck. Listen, I'm never gonna fucking disrespect the guy that looks the way Saquon Barkley looks. Mm-hmm. I, I do. I don't know actually. Like the injury is obviously wildly concerning. Um, mm-hmm. But from everything I've seen uh, from the people that are actual doctors, there should not be a cause for concern on on Barkley's return timetable. So I'm gonna proceed uh, as if he's going to be pretty much fine going into the regular season until we hear otherwise and theoretically this could be the best offense he's ever played in you feel me because adding kenny galladay and a lot of people are super down on kenny galladay he's another one that i kind of want to get to later when we get to that round but like i'm down for for saquon barkley a lot of people are disrespecting him he's one of the most talented running backs in the league um the only question mark for me is the whole daniel jones thing but Saquon. Yeah, that, that's the only thing. Like when you say, "Oh, this could be the best offense he has ever played with," that that feels like a that feels like an Allen Robinson thing. Like every year, it's like this is the best quarterback he's ever played with, but it's literally just like flipping a, a piece little- of shit over. <laughs> it went from <laughs> went from Mitch Trubisky to, to Nick Foles. You know what I mean? It's like we were excited about Nick fucking Foles last year. Mm-hmm. We're, I feel like we're probably doing that the same thing with the Giants offense this year. That that uh, that storyline very rarely works out. I feel like. I mean, you're not you're not wrong at all. But we're both tucking Saquon Barkley. Take on Barkley's a big tuck. Round two. Round two. We started off with the one and only, the wide receiver one for as many years as I can remember, except 2019. Devontae Adams. Tuck. He's a big tuck for me as well. Aaron Rodgers is going to be back. He's going to play this. Think, he's going to play you, this year in Green Bay, and then he's going to get traded after this year. He'll be he'll be in Green Bay for one more year. Draft accordingly. So I <laughs> He's put the next stamp of approval. Back. I'm I'm nervous about Aaron, bro. I'm very nervous about Mr. A.A. Ron himself. Um, I don't know if he wants to be a Green Bay Packer. And I don't think that the I think the Packers have too much pride to let him go. So 
I, I think that it might just be a standoff, a standout, whatever they call this, a holdout. Yeah, that's what it's called. And <laughs> one, of uh, one of those three. And uh, yeah, which would severely diminish Devontae Adams' value from if Jordan Love is throwing him the ball, the type of balls he's getting thrown is is not the same when you yeah, got Jordan Love. Radio. I'm not even on. I'm, I'm shirtless. I'm not <laughs> even on talks. Yeah. Fuck that. <laughs> So, so, but I, I, I'm, I'm iffy on the Aaron Rodgers, but gun to my head, if I had to choose whether or not he would play in Green Bay, I would choose that he does. I think, yeah, I think he turned down that long term extension because he doesn't want to be there long term. But I, I don't think, uh, I don't think he's out of there before this year. I feel like it's getting a little bit too deep into this summer, where if there was going to be a trade, you know, if anything was going to happen, if they had the right assets that Green Bay was like comfortable moving Rodgers for. I don't know. It's like, listen, the NFL season is not that far off. It's really like a month away, you know, a month and a couple of weeks away. So uh, they're, they're pretty deep into it to make a major move like that at this point. hundred uh, percent. Next guy, Joe Mixon. Uh, I'm tucking. I'm, I'm tucking tuck. as well. I'm, I'm, I'm like on Mixon. I'm tucked. Geo's gone. Could be a really good offense and passing attack. They've already proven that they're willing to make him a workhorse. Joe Burrow, T Higgins, Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd, like, I'm, I don't see what there's not what what there isn't to like about that situation for him. Yeah, it was always Gio holding it back for me. Uh, as long as Gio was there, he was not going to get the passing down work. And now, I mean, he's com- he's competing with Samaji P Ryan, who looks like <laughs> like who Samaji P Ryan basically ate Samaji P Ryan, and that's that's who he is at this point. But he'll get a couple carries. But like Mixon's got all three downs. Hundred uh, percent. Moving on to round three. Uh, we already kind of spoke about Keenan Allen. I think we're both tucking Keenan Allen. Big time. We don't, tuck, we don't yeah. need to say much more about I a, that. I got a belt on tucked in. Let's go. <laughs> a suit and tie and everything for Keenan Allen. Next up in round three, DeAndre Swift. I've untucked. Uh, I've, I've, gone, untucked I've gone back and Calvary. forth on this guy. I, I'm probably going to untuck it as well. He was like, he was like a. a, a <laughs> I love that you actually untucked. <laughs> he was. Well, I'm participating, man. I, I want to play the fucking game. He was like a late second round pick in early in the summer. And now he's like dropping to the end of the third, early fourth. I feel like he's an easy fade in the second. He's a, an easy smash in the fourth. Third round is where it gets dicey, man. It just feels like uh, them bringing in Jamal Williams is, is, is the scariest thing to me. Very unsettling. Yeah. And this is like, you know, it, it's easy to say, oh, look what Aaron Jones did when Jamal Williams was in the offense, but they were also averaging 30 points a game where exactly. Aaron Jones can score 13 rushing touchdowns, 15 rushing touchdowns. I think he went for fucking 17 rushing touchdowns in a year. Like the Lions Swift, could be the worst offense in the league this yeah, year. But. Exactly. Like the, the the upside on Swift is should get a ton of passing work, but there are going to be games where Jamal Williams takes over and he gets 17 carries probably and Swift, you know, might score six rushing touchdowns or something. So I'm I'm very uh I'm I'm very cooled off on on swift 100 percent. moving on to round four uh, so for round four i had miles i don't sanders. like that sound okay. i had miles sanders so we could pre- run through that untucked. i'm pretty sure we're untucked uh jamar chase i'm gonna un- untuck that i feel like just rookie wide receivers in general i know we've seen everyone's a lot of them. super high because we've of seen a Justin lot of them Jefferson. explode yeah we've seen a lot of them explode over recent years but more often than not like you play the percentages and it's not going to work in favor and it's it was like it, it was okay to draft them when you got to draft them with some room to like uh, to fuck up right like you, normally these rookies that explode you get them in like the eighth ninth tenth twelfth like justin jefferson was probably a 16th round pick or something last year but you're damn you're near drafting, drafting jamar chase at his chase, ceiling like, right like his ceiling is like a thousand yards this year probably i'm i don't like a thousand yards does not really entice me from my fourth round pick you know like i want like i want deandre swift in the fourth round if i can get him there i want mm-hmm. i want a, a wide receiver in the fourth round that has 1200 1300 yards even though maybe they're riskier than chase is i don't know fourth round pick for chase is the wildly untucked I also untucked, by the way. So, boom, we're, we're really on the same page here today. We round are. five. Round five. Uh, I had Kenny Galladay, but I feel like we kind of spoke on that. Uh, so, Brandon Ayuk. Um, I'm going to untuck in round five. It's a little early for my liking. I, I think there are... I think there are too many good passing options. I do think that he is the making of an alpha, and I do think he mm-hmm. will surpass Debo Samuel from a talent level really quickly but we have Kittle Debo Ayuk in a passing offense that's not a passing offense you know like they're a run first offense if Trey Lance gets on the field that's another eight to ten rushes a game it's just it's going to be like okay he would need to have in order for him to average like eight targets a game 
on, on a on an offense that throws the ball thirty times, he would need to have like an abs- absurd like twenty seven to twenty eight percent target share. And I just like I don't see how the math works out for Ayuk to be uh, to be returning. I mean, probably a good floor play, but I don't, I don't see how he returns value in the fifth round. I I was also untucking on Ayuk, uh, Kyler Murray in round five. I tucked. I'll I up. tucked all the way. I tucked big, big all tuck. the way I'm tucking down. into my socks. It's my underwear. <laughs> yeah. oh, boom. Straight into my fucking better. shoes and shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Kyler, I'm uh I'm I'm definitely on board with Kyler. I think even in like a single quarterback league, he's unbelievable. Like what he did last year before he got hurt was absurd, absurd numbers. Um now being healthy, they add Rondell Moore to the mix, third year in Cliff's offense. So hope I mean, hopefully that fucking means something other than just like wasting my breath on on a podcast. But I, I'm very much in on Kyler, bro. He was he was the first ten games. I think he didn't go under like 24.8 fantasy points in a single game. I'm like that. I didn't realize that until like a, a week or two ago, and it was like the craziest stat I've ever seen. He's insane. I feel like the upside for him is huge on in the ground, on the ground, through the air. Like he's he's on he's just unstoppable. Uh, round six, um, Devonta Smith, another another eagle. We we tucked. I mean, we untucked Miles Sanders, but I'm tucking Mr. Devonta Smith. Uh, Smith is a guy where if he creeps into the sixth round, I'm probably going to look elsewhere, but I think in a lot of friends and family leagues, you'll, you'll be able to get him later, mm-hmm. which I'm in for. I think he's one of the few rookies that does have like that thousand yard receiving upside. I think he comes in as the alpha immediately in the Eagles offense that is like wildly devoid of, of playmakers, especially uh, on the outside. They have Jalen Rager, who's going to move into the slot this year and be- behind him, they literally don't have another wide receiver to play the outside. So I think he'll, he'll, I think he goes into hundred to 110 targets ASAP. It's going to come down to whether or not Jalen hurts can deliver those, uh, those accurately. They've got some chemistry because they played together at Alabama, yeah. obviously for a year, but um, yeah, Devontae Smith, I think, I think he's a risk worth taking in a, in a couple of leagues because the upside is definitely there. Uh, the next six round uh, player, I have Javante Williams. I untucked. I know a lot of people are high on him, uh, but and like it's fuck Melvin Gordon. Uh, I hear that from, from a lot of places everywhere. But like, I just don't really want in the sixth round. Uh, I feel like this is well known as the RB dead zone, and he's one of those running backs for me. I don't really want to take him here. I would rather be taking the wide receivers on the board in round six than take a shot on Javante Williams. Uh, some people see a lot of potential in the Broncos offense. If everything hits exactly how it's supposed to hit, then sure, I can see that. But I just don't foresee that exactly happening. And I don't really want the running back on this team, on this offense. I'm with you. I'm not a, I'm, I'm, I'm going to untuck on Javante right now until, I don't know. I, I think I want to see the preseason games. I want to see how they split the first team snaps between the two. Cause I still feel like it's just going to be Melvin Gordon being the starter and not necessarily getting starter touches, but even if Melvin Gordon's out there and gets like 12, 13, 14 touches a game, doesn't really leave a lot of room for Javante Williams to be like a workhorse. He could be one of those guys again. Maybe he's a cheaper version of like Travis Etienne where the rookie we get hyped about, draft him really early, is a big piece of the offense in weeks 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Depends whether or not you want to kind of sit him there because, I mean, they've used the committee over the last few years in Denver, and I, I feel like that's going to be the case. There's also a chance that this offense tanks again. Like, what if Drew Locke is just terrible? What if Teddy what if he's just bad? Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's also a lot of red flags with Javante. So I'm not I'm not like sold on Javante enough as a pure prospect to be like, I, I'm going to buy in on him uh, for redraft right now until Mel- like Melvin Gordon's still very much there and he's still going to get a lot of touches. I'm with you. Uh, kind of getting to the back end of this whole thing, round seven. Um, I feel like we can we can get through this one. Justin Herbert, we both tucked, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Just right. big, big tuck on Justin Herbert. Uh Lavishka Chenault. I personally untucked just because I feel like in round like the hype, I feel like round seven is might be the floor of where he ends up getting to because the hype on every other day I see a Lavishka Chenault hype tweet, hype video. Um, I think he's a great athlete. I think he's a great weapon, which is what Urban Meyer is looking for in that whole RPO offensive scheme. I don't know how good of a receiver he is. And so I'm gonna untuck. I'm not like I'm not passing on LaVisca Chanel. Like I would take him. 
I'm just not that high. Like I'm, I'm lower on him than everyone else. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, he's an untuck for me. He's actually, I'm, I think I'm probably actively fading him. I, it just feels like this Jaguars offense. They're gonna have more fucking Sports Center top ten plays than actual like top ten <laughs> players in fantasy. You know what I mean? Like they're just gonna, they're they're gonna have highlight plays because Urban Meyer is gonna keep moving them around the formation and like doing weird fucking trick plays all the time. But who knows what that's gonna lead to in terms of volume? It could be a, a, a thing where Lavisca catches four balls a game and gets like two or three carries. I'm just like. I, I I just don't see a lot of uh, upside there. I think this is I think it's going to be a run first offense too. I do think it's actually going to run through uh, James Robinson and Carlos Hyde and some touches of Travis Etienne or whatever. But I don't think the volume will be there enough for Lavisca to like really separate himself from DJ Chark and uh, Marvin Jones and and Travis Etienne as a pass catcher. Hundred percent. I think Marvin Jones is actually a pretty good value to be honest. But um, yeah, round eight, uh, the two I got in here. We can start it off with Jarvis Landry. I untucked. Um, I don't really want a receiver, whether it's Odell or Jarvis, in on this Browns offense. Uh, Jarvis had a single top 12 finish in all of 2020, and now it's with Odell basically missing damn near the entire year. Uh, I just don't see myself taking Jarvis Landry in any of my drafts. I'm actually I'm, – I'm tucked on Jarvis. I've, Ooh, uh, okay. I've come around a little bit. He's been the same player for like the last four years, and I was looking at numbers last year because I remember I'm pretty high on Baker this year. I'm definitely higher on consensus – on Baker. And I think a lot of the reason people are down on the offense, one, they're obviously run heavy, but they had that stretch. There was three games in a row the weather. where yeah, Baker legitimately averaged 12 completions a game for three straight yeah. games. Um, and it's like when you when you discount those games, Jarvis Landry is back to averaging 11 half PPR fantasy points a game, exactly what he was the three years prior. So I just think he's a very solid staple this passing offense. He doesn't give you he doesn't give you any sort of upside, but I think um Whereas you'd normally have to draft him in the fifth, sixth, seventh round, you're starting to get him later and later and later in drafts, and you still are getting like a flex spot that you can just get 10 points a game from. So I'm, I'm tucking on Jarvis. So would you rather have Landry or Lavishka? I'll probably, I'll probably take Landry. All right. But I right, wait another one Landry or Devonta Smith. I'll take Smith there. Me too. I'm with you there. Um, next round, a guys was Raheem Mostert. Um, I untucked just because it is going to be a, a a run heavy offense for uh, I believe, and I I'm just higher on Trey Sermon. Like I think you can get Trey Sermon a couple rounds later and maybe produce damn near the same value and take someone else in round eight than take Raheem Mostert here. No, nah, they won't produce the same value because Trey Sermon's about to pop the fuck off. I'm untucked. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm I'm all the way untucked on Mostert because I'm I'm all in on Sermon. <laughs> So is, is he like your Miles Sanders? Is that what we are we chill, do? We chill, not want to send the juju. Chill. Yeah, chill. <laughs> I feel you. Don't, don't send Miles towards him. <laughs> he, he needs to stay far, far away from that. Um, I'm, in on, I'm in on Sermon though. I'm very sold on him as a player. Yeah, I'm. I'm big on Trey Sermon. Uh, round nine. So we only got round nine. Round ten left. Round nine. Mister Ronald Jones. This was a guy I had last year before they signed Leonard Fournette, so he severely fucked my team. So I am going to go untucked, to be honest. I've got a little bit of bias, but it is what it is. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to untuck on Ronald Jones. I want a piece of this running game. I really do because they're going to score so many points, but I actually prefer Leonard Fournette. I, mm-hmm. I feel like they showed you – what they preferred at the end of last year, like Fournette went off the last, the, the entire playoffs. He went crazy. Yeah. Uh, he was the preferred pass catching back. We'll have to see what happens with Gio. Um, one of these guys probably won't, won't make the team. Uh, it might be Keyshawn Vaughn. It might be mm-hmm. Gio. Uh, if Gio's cut, then I think it's wheels up for, for uncle Lenny and he's going later and later into the round. So I think you kind of got to choose between one of the two and just give me the guy who, uh, who probably has pass catching upside in, in Fournette. So I'm going to untuck on Rojo. Imagine Gio got cut and like the Bengals just signed him. <laughs> Yo, they could use a pass catching back. <laughs> oh, the next guy kind of back to that Broncos offense. Noah Fant. Uh, I've seen a lot of people high on Noah Fant when it comes to tight ends. Like I said, everyone's always looking for that tight end sleeper that's going to pop off the Hayden Hurst of 2019, mm-hmm. the TJ Hawkinsons of last year. Um, and the Darren Wallers of the year before. And so like some people believe that Noah Fant is that guy. I don't believe that Noah Fant is that guy. I'm untucked on Noah Fant. Um, like I said, I just don't really want a piece of the Broncos offense. I'm cool without having that Broncos offense. Like I said with ETN, I'm cool with missing the breakout. If he does pop off this year, then cool. I'll just take him next year. But I would rather take I'd rather take a guy like Higby or even later, like I, I don't even want to say my sleeper, but 
Adam Troutman. Hey, I like okay. him. I like Adam Troutman. Fair. He's um, a popular sleeper pick. And so I'll uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll wear I'm gonna wear a button down where like the bottom of it is like flapping around, and I'll tuck one half in. I'll keep one half untucked on Noah Fan. I don't really have a hard take on him to be honest. This is the Broncos' offense is just such a tricky one to try to project for 2021. Man, it's you have Jerry Judy who's a crazy route runner. You got Sutton coming back from the ACL. Fans obviously wildly athletic. We have no idea what's going to happen at quarterback. We have no idea what's going to happen at running. We literally don't know fucking anything about this offense. Mm-hmm. Like you can't look at any position and tell me like what's going to come out of it. So <laughs> with Fant, it's like I don't know. Like I'm not comfortable taking him at his ADP, but like I'll be comfortable in a draft if he drops to me around or something. So not an active fade, not an active target. Um, I'll probably sound dumb in about a year from now for saying this though. Hey, I mean, it will sound dumb together, so no big deal. Um, round 10, last final round, we have Mr. Corey Davis. Uh, I a 10th round pick. I So I was going through underdog, right? And I was like, there's no way. But when I put QB wide receiver tight end and looked at all of the ADPs and everything, he was in the 10th round. Yeah, I, I guess I guess people are just uh, I, I guess you have to assume he's the number one there. Right. And he's going to get the most targets like he's going to get a really boring 90 to 100 targets. Uh, so I don't really love the 10th round price on him, but he's def- he's not someone I'm probably going to fade. I think Elijah Moore is probably the guy that is getting a lot more excitement right now because he's a, you know, a, a buzzy rookie. And I think mm-hmm. it's probably rightfully so. I think he's a really, really um He's a guy that you should keep a very close eye on. He's one of those guys that, like, with rookie wide receivers, I don't tend to draft them. But if they pop off very early on in the year, you start to see them getting more play time. They're the guys you should be using your waiver wire priorities on very, very quickly because we've seen them assimilate to offenses like, you know, T. Higgins last year, Chase Claypool, Justin Jefferson, all of those guys. They show the gl- the glimpses of it, and you're like, y- you should, you have to be picking those up. I feel like Elijah Moore could be a guy like that who comes off – week one five for 75 and a touchdown or something like that. And then just continues to be the guy there. So I will probably stay untucked on Corey Davis. Cause he's just too fucking boring. Okay. <laughs> and keep in mind, like the ADPs on underdog are pretty juiced. Like anyone that has any kind of hype is higher than they would typically be. Yeah. So, you know, it is what it is, but um, kind of the last guy to ho- end this whole game, tuck or untuck out. We have the one and only Mr. James Connor. I, I myself, I haven't done it all, 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 uh, all podcasts, but I am, I'm tucking, I'm tucking on James. <laughs> all right. I've um, tucked on James Connor. I feel like if you put him in that same Kenyon Drake role, Kenyon Drake got a shit ton of touches. He was just, he wasn't even bad. He was the RB 12 in standard leagues last year. Uh, if Connor even like, like Kenyon Drake had the fourth most carries in the red zone, third most carries inside the five. If James Conner takes like 70% of that, he should outperform his ADP. And so I'm, I'm, I'm tucked on James Conner. I am as hard as it is to believe I'm tucked on James Conner. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I'm necessarily like tucked on James Conner. Like I want to draft him. I just know he's going to piss more people off than not that expect Chase Edmonds to be the guy like James Conner is going to play a a big fucking role in this offense. He's going to play the Drake role because Chase Edmonds has, this is a stat I tweeted out like last week, which is insane when I found it out, but he has one career goal line carry. Like (laughs) Chase Edmonds, Chase Edmonds has played 48 games or whatever it is, three, four years worth of games. I forget what the actual number was, but he has one career goal line carry. He's never topped a hundred carries in a given season. That's insane. I mean, Cliff has told you Cliff's been there the entire time that Chase has. So Cliff has told you exactly how he feels about Chase and it's not being the featured uh, workhorse running back. Yeah, he'll catch a lot of passes, but a lot of that is going to be James Conner's role. So, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm like definitely for I think there's a spot in drafts right around the 10th round where you have guys that you know that they're boring, but you know they're going to get volume. It's it's like James Conner. It's all the guys that were going in like the third round last year. James yeah. Conner, David Johnson, um, Gus Edwards, not third round last year, but like still a guy who's going to have a lot of early down work and probably their team's goal line work where I think that's like a really good spot to secure your, you know, third, fourth, fifth back, wherever you are in your draft. And then after that, like the tears drop all the way the fuck off. So I will, I'll, I'll, I'll tuck it in with you for Connor there. Boom. And so that ends the game. Tuck or untuck, bro. I'm, I'm, thank you for participating. I think it was a, I think it was a damn successful idea. To it's be my honest. favorite. Anytime I could fucking tuck my shirt, and I will, <laughs> I will participate to the, to the nth, to the one hundred tenth degree. Exactly. I, I, a hundred percent love it. And so I'm, I'm gonna let you go, bro. I know you got things to do tonight. I want to say <laughs> I do appreciate you for coming on the pod, bro. Um, 
is, is there anything you want to plug? Everybody that's listening to this knows you, but go ahead. <laughs> Uh, no, man, just thanks for having me on. It was, it was a lot of fun. I like the, I'm honestly thinking about tucking the, uh, stealing the Tucker Untuck uh, as a segment on my own, on my own show. So nah, go if, ahead, bro. Do you, if you see that pop off? I apologize in advance. But uh, <laughs> nah. no, it was a lot of fun. Uh, you guys could find me on YouTube, just Nick Ercolano. Um, just, you know, full name. If you Google it, you'll, you'll probably be able to find it wherever. Uh, but that's, that's all for now. And, and thanks again for having me. Of course, bro. So, yeah, we're going to go ahead and get up on out of here. Make sure you guys subscribe to the Run It Up Pod on Apple Podcasts. Leave that rating and review. Download the pod on Spotify. Share it with your friends and family. You can find me on Twitter at Najee Adams underscore. The pod on Twitter is at Run It Up Pod. I hope you guys have a litty day, a lead night, a litty life. <laughs> and just like we do every episode of this podcast, make sure y'all go run it up.